Just a minute. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this. Say it again. Hello, everyone. I, I hope uh, it is I, visible I and the audible. Instructions to go into my preferences within Chrome. Uh, and then Jonathan? I, it, Jonathan? Yes, I'm sorry, Perche. No, it's not. It's not. It's not required. So it is already there. Your PowerPoint is here. So we we have gone live. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, part of our seminar series, organized by the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Jodhpur. And um, today is a major international event for all of us. We have uh, three speakers today. Um, we have. Uh, Mariano Mesman, associated with uh, Universidad de Buenos Aires, and CONICET, the National Research Council of Argentina. We have Professor Jonathan Baxbaum, who teaches at the Queen's College, uh, CUNY, City University of New York, USA. We have Dr. Drake Stotsman, uh, who is an adjunct professor at NYU, New York University, USA. And she is the editor of uh, Framework, the Journal of Cinema and Media. Uh, now, this recent issue of Framework focuses on third cinema. And it's a major event for the Anglophone Film Studies fraternity, I would say, because for the first time, uh, they have published quite a few writings by Fernando Solanas and Octavio Hitino, along with uh, some writings on the film Laura de los Hornos, or The Hour of the Furnaces, from Guy Enabel's cinema action group, Dosia. It's a major event because except for Towards the Third Cinema, Asia Un Tercer Cine, the, the most iconic one by Solanas and Hetino, other writings by the duo remained hitherto untranslated. So this issue of framework has published translations of two major writings, one by Solanas and Hetino on militant cinema, one by Hetino, which revisits their views and standpoints on third cinema, and also Guy Enable's, you know, the cinema action dossier on uh, third cinema and the film Laura de los Hornos. So far, the Anglophone film studies scholars remained mostly, you know, uh, in the dark regarding these untranslated writings because as I've just mentioned other writings, including the book that they published from Buenos Aires, Solanas and Hetino, Cine, Cultura y Descolonización, or Cinema, Culture and Decolonization also remained untranslated. Now, I would like to thank all our speaker, Mariano Mesman, Jonathan Baxbaum and Drake Stutzman for agreeing to um, organize this with us, co-organize this with our department um, and we would start with Dr. Drake Stotsman's address um, regarding this special framework issue. This is a recorded talk uh, from Drake, so I'd like to play this. Could you start it from the beginning, please? Yes, that's the very beginning. And then no, th this, is, this will be the order. No, that's not the beginning. It's There's a frame before this. OK, so would you like to? Uh, Say a few words, Rick, and then I can show the PowerPoint, the recorded oh. file, if you want. Uh, no, I, I think I, uh, what I'm doing is uh, uh, because uh, Jonathan and uh, Mariana will talk so in such detail about the framework, the issue. I am just introducing framework, but giving a little history of it and bringing it up to date of what kind of things that we do and why uh, this is such a great thing to have for us. So, okay. Just go back that one frame. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go for a full screen layout for this recorded talk. Issue that came out in the spring, and they have done new translations of uh, the third cinema writers. So I'll leave it to them to talk about it. But I'm gonna give you a little sense of what Framework is. So Framework is a peer reviewed international journal. It's 
published biannually by Wayne State University Press. Uh, the volumes are available on the Wayne State University Press website in the journal section. And also you can read it on JSTOR and Muse and EBSO and ProQuest, which are, uh, if you have access to that through maybe your library or university, you have the subscription. So we also have a very active website, frameworknow.com, and that uh, has a huge archive uh, of all the issues with the table of contents and editorials going all the way back to the beginning when it started in the 70s. So you can find on that website news, uh, which really covers a whole range of things. Uh, we have reviews, films, film festivals in particular, with essays. We have a section on Prison USA, which is constantly updated. Uh, I, I think it's better to look at it. It's just uh, like a flood of information about um, any different aspect of uh, prison situation, prison experience, prison, how do you, you know, what's happening in prisons. And uh, we also have another section called Prejudice Now, which is a focus on prejudice in particular with guest columnists writing about it. And we also have a platform now for avant-garde film. At the moment, we have a focus on Warren Sonberg, who I'm gonna to come to later uh, in an issue that we actually uh, published a lot of his writings. So uh, we have a, a channel, a streaming channel, so we're using that and we want to um, interact with the print journal in, in, in new ways. So let me give you some background about Framework. Framework actually is quite an old journal. It was started in 1974 in England with some really interesting people got together to put it together. Robin Wood was one of the first, uh, and there have been uh, a variety of others. They had very strong ideas about what they felt would be a good way to um, enter the stream of people writing about film in particular. So I'm gonna talk about Paul Willeman in particular. He was an editor in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, he's also, of course, a very well-known writer and he wrote about third cinema. On the um, website frameworknow.com, there is a history of framework that Paul Willeman wrote. It's quite long and really detailed. And even if you're not that interested in framework per se, it really goes into a lot of um, really the whole history of what's going on around it, the context, other magazines were writing, how, how they were changing or not changing, this kind of thing, um, how people were approaching even considering film. So uh, I'm gonna use a couple of words and quotes that Paul Willeman uses in his history. So he called it an open forum. I think they were looking for something like that in which they were gonna approach the most diverse current trends in film theory, the most diverse aspects of film culture um, from Hollywood to Africa and Latin America. And those are his words, but also it's much further than that. So they set out to break the mold and they really did trailblaze in film coverage in particular. They had special is issues on the cinema of uh, systems of the movies that were coming out of these countries that was really unprecedented for the time. So they had whole issues that focused on Chinese cinema, Vietnamese cinema, Sri Lankan cinema, British cinema, Indian cinema, Latin American cinema, Australian cinema. And those were whole issues, but there were obviously smaller parts where they would focus in different ways. Many interviews that are just fan fantastic. So if you go to the framework website, you'll see a list table of contents of all of those journals. So they wanted variety of writing uh, from a variety of perspectives and they really looked hard for that and found really great people. So Jean-Luc Godard wrote for them, Coco Fusco wrote for them, uh, Youssef Shaheen, uh, Piero Pasolini, uh, Sunala um, Abbasakira, uh, uh, Rustam Barucha, Michelle Wallace, uh, Peter Wallen, and many others. They also reprinted 1920s uh, cinema classics. And uh, so you had uh, Richi Otto Canudo, and you had Dorothy Richardson, and you have uh, Jermaine Jalak, but and also others. This was also very interesting that really wanted to dig deep. How did these people look with such great imagination, real talent, looking at what cinema was coming out? Uh, these are 1920s writers and uh, very imaginative ways of looking at things. They set the 
they set them old really. So Framework lapsed in 1992 and was relaunched in 1998. Uh, and I was actively involved uh, it, at that time and I'm, I've been involved ever since. Um, so framework games are very similar. They are just expanded, I suppose, and they, they, are, they have their own particularities. We want to mix and merge and not separate. Uh, and we really want to actively engage ideas about film and media with the larger public conversations, which really covers all sorts of subjects. So it's not just like, let's look at politics in this particular way. Let's mix it together in how we're all perceiving things, how things are evolving. So there's a specific focus on feminism, politics, prejudice, and prison, and that's been around uh, for some time. Obviously, we cover many other things too. So Framework has published diverse work and art um, by many contributors. We, so we do do a lot of art stuff. Um, contributors have been architects, directors, they've been um, scholars that were just starting out that are really leading in their fields now. We've had performance artists, we've had um, curators, a whole variety of people and more. Uh, and we also have published out of print or unpublished, untranslated or not previously collecting writing by, among others, to just name these four, Peter Whitehead, Thomas L. Sasser, Fernando Solanas, and Warren Sonbert. And I'll come to Sonbert later also. So just to give you some, I just go through some issues then just give you some little details about some of the things that were either um, the whole of the issue or dossiers within the issue. So in fall of 2020, we did a special dossier on Usman Samben, the Senegalese um, film director and novelist who is one of the great forces in cinema. And it was guest edited by Samba Gajigo, who was his executor, a very close friend, um, and also co-director with Jason Silverman of this incredible documentary on Samben that's called Samben with an exclamation point. And it is really, 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 really good. So I really recommend you seek that out. So in spring 2020, we did a focus that was the whole issue on queer and avant-garde and in performance art. Uh, we had, there's an interview with Steve McQueen. The guest editors were Ron Gregg and William Simmons. So it's quite eclectic. Some of them are, again, sort of visual essays, uh, but they're done by the performance artists themselves. In many cases, there's also some scholars and some writing in particular. So in fall of 2018, we did a dossier on four visual essays by filmmakers Rob Roth, M.M. Sarah, Betty Gordon, and Michelle Handelman, all really interesting directors. They use film in really, really, really hands-on ways, all very different. Uh, and they made essays out of images. They were images that spoke about how these images represented their work in a, sweet, in a sequential way. So very interesting. And we also followed up uh, with a screening with, uh, we, we worked, we, we, we co-did it with um, M.M. Sarah at the Filmmakers Co-op, which is a, uh, a co-op here in New York that is uh, a huge collection of avant-garde film, incredible collection. So in 2017, again, just a few other dossiers. We did a dossier on French cinema at the margins with guest editor Eric Smoudin, dossier uh, Manish Sharma's film Fan with the guest editors uh, Anupama Kaps and Mahili Seen. In 2015, we did this very special issue on Warren Sonbert. It really was, I think, a very super unique uh, it was certainly the first publication of his collected writings that in itself is unique. Guest editor John Gartenberg, who was his, his uh, executor and also a very close friend. And uh, in this case, what we did is we scanned all the pages. So the pages are the actual pages that were, you know, the clippings, the, 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 um, the opera tickets, the, um, the typed... Uh, opera script that Sonbert did and typed on onion paper, which was a, an, a, an old style kind of paper from the 70s. And so you can see the, you can see the sort of 
the context, the, almost the material context of that world. And I think that's very special in, in how you look at something. Also, there are annotations in his writing, and we also um, have annotations um, in the back to uh, in things that are perhaps not uh, not clear to the eye. You can't read it that well. So it's a spectacular issue. And also, even if you can't read English, it's very interesting to be able to visually see these things, you know, what kind of columns were used in magazines at that time and what was the type like and that kind of thing. That can all be very interesting. So in 2011, we did this massive double volume um, on uh, Peter Whitehead. It's a double volume because each of the two volumes are in fact double issues themselves. So it's really like a four volume set. And it's uh, published um, writings by Peter Whitehead that had never been published before. Uh, he did a visual essay there that um, really speaks for itself. It's quite wonderful. There's a lot of essays uh, from a whole variety of different kinds of people. And uh, it's, uh, it's unique. He was very, very pleased that it was made. Um, and uh, we were very glad to be able to work on it. So the editors there were Paul Cronin and James Riley. Uh, Paul Cronin had done a, a couple of films on Peter Whitehead and also James Riley was his personal editor and I'm the editor of Framer, but I was also an editor on this. So in 2015, for instance, we did a dossier on geopolitics and theory. It's a really, really interesting collection of writers um, looking at theory around the world, how it sort of emerges out of geopolitics. It's 2015, so it wasn't quite as um, big a subject as it is today. So we were very lucky to have that back then. And in fall of 2020, uh, 2012, sorry, uh, there was a dossier that we did on experimental film and the experimental word. Uh, it had great people involved looking at this intersection between these two mediums. Uh, P. Adam Sidney, Rebecca Ritkoff, Richard Deeming, uh, Susan Howe, and myself, we were all in, involved in that dossier. And also uh, Matthew Solomon did a Melier, on, worked on Melier's caricatures, which is a very interesting essay. And uh, Jamie Barron uh, wrote about the experimental remake. So it's a really interesting issue. And then in spring of 2012, we did a focus on labor. So we had a dossier of work of the image. That's really sort of, how do you cut something? How does something work? Uh, the guest editor was Elena Gorfinkel. And um, we did an also an, another dossier, but on the sort of union side of things, which is working life now and then where the guest editor was Iwa um, uh, Pazirska. So, really interesting intermix of these in a funny way seemingly separate things but of course they're deeply intertwined and also they're in incredibly separate uh so just to finish with framework upcoming in 2021 and 2022 um we have two uh parts that are coming up one is fall of 2021 which is coming out soon is the future of film it's guest edited by michelle baruti and maggie henfeld and it is um very interactive with the website there there are connections and links and there we we have a streaming channel and there's an interconnection between the printed page and what you can actually visually see on the website and in the spring and uh, fall of 2022 we have uh an issue a double issue on called uh, Exquisite Historiography. And it's about how you, um, how you look at researching history, how it's put together. What is it to be collaborative? Because it's always collaborative. You, you have to find something, uh, you have to talk to somebody, you have to put it together. It's subjective, it's also very objective. Um, so it's playful in a sense, this issue, people are putting, uh, bringing in films that they put together in a collaborative way. There's also writing. Uh, it's a huge range and I think it's a great subject. People are very interested in the whole exquisite corpse way of putting things together right now. But um, this is just another uh, addition to that conversation. So I'm very much looking forward to our conversation following this and what uh, Mariano and John, uh, Jonathan will have to say and what you will all be discussing. Um, so um, 
Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Rick. Thanks a lot for this. Now I would like to invite uh, Jonathan. Uh, and before that, I would like to introduce uh, Jonathan once again. So Jonathan um, is a professor of media studies at Queens College, City University of New York. And his areas of interest include political cinema and third cinema. He has published Cinema Engage, Film in the Popular Front, Cinema and the Sandinistas, Filmmaking in Revolutionary Nicaragua, and the most recent one uh, to come out in 2017 uh, is Exception Taken, How France Has Defied Hollywood's New World Order. So Jonathan, who has guest edited this um, framework issue with Mariano Mespan, will be sharing his thoughts with us now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Parashay. Uh, and thank you for this invitation to all of us to present this new issue of framework. Uh, I'm going to proceed through the PowerPoint live, as it were, if it works. So let's see. Uh, you're going to have to confirm for me a little bit that it is working. Is the second slide coming up on screen? It is. It is working. Great. Uh, thank you. So obviously, we would like to thank Drake uh, for inviting us to participate in framework in this issue on third cinema. Uh, and of course, for me, I'm delighted to work again in collaboration with Drake since I've worked with her before uh, on a number of issues, not issues of framework, but one of the issues on framework that we collaborated on earlier. So thank you, Drake, and thank you for that presentation. Uh, I'm eager actually to go look at some of those materials. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I'm just showing the screen here of the table of contents of the issue that Mariano and I put together. Uh, I'm not sure how this, how legible it is, but there are three essays that were translations and then the introduction and the photo essay uh, that Mariano and I put together. So, Essentially, I would like to describe two linked histories behind our choice of these three translated texts. One has to do with language hierarchies. I'm, I'm getting a little bit of extraneous noise, which I don't think is coming from me. I don't hear it now. Thank you. So one of the topics I want to consider is that of language hierarchies, a topic no doubt familiar to many of you in the audience today. And the other topic concerns more substantive issues. And I'll try and go through this in a relatively quick way. So the question of translation is a challenging one. The Third Cinema Manifesto itself was published in a journal called Tricontinental, which referred to, and it came out of Cuba. And Tricontinental referred to the three continents listed there, Africa, Asia, and, Asia, and Latin America, uh, which began publication, I think, in 65 or 1965 or 1966. And clearly, uh, one continent that we're often very familiar with, Europe, is not present. So clearly this is a journal and a thrust that wants to uh, 
uh, demote, as it were, wants to, I'm sorry, I'm hearing noise on occasion. I'll just try and talk through it. Uh, obviously, they were interested in demoting Eurocentrism, uh, which is an idea presumably familiar to most of you, perhaps all of you by now also. So English, so this was published also in four different languages at the time, simultaneously. Uh, that is separate issues in English, French, Spanish, and Italian. Uh, I, I won't dwell on the irony of Tricontinental being published in four uh, Anglo-European languages, but such is the nature of colonialism, uh, as we all know by now. Now, traditionally, in film studies, English and French have dominated cinema studies, which includes also militant cinema. So with the explosion of Latin American cinema in the 1960s, various manifestos emerged. Most translated quickly into English and French and some into other languages. But only Towards a Third Cinema was published in a journal like Tricontinental, based in Cuba, but published in those four languages. So part of what I'm trying to describe briefly is what makes Towards a Third Cinema an, a unique document. They don't call it exactly a manifesto, but it's often referred to as a manifesto. And that makes it particularly interesting because their scope and their ambition extended far beyond Latin America. They wanted to have a uh, anti-colonialist resonance throughout the world. So part of what was unusual about Towards the Third Cinema was that it was published in Tricontinental unlike any of the other manifestos that didn't have such a broad uh, scope and ambition. In addition, the writers of the Third Cinema Manifesto developed their manifesto only after making the film that Parache referred to earlier, uh, Hour of the Furnaces in 1968. So this was a link of practice and theory. When I say this, I mean the manifesto came out of the practice of the production and distribution of the film in Argentina and elsewhere, as Mariano will comment on briefly later. Also, and this is really important for this particular issue of framework, unlike the other manifestos from Latin America, Solanus and Gatino wrote many other articles and interviews elaborating and clarifying their ideas. So you see here a book of their writings in Spanish published in 1973 with a, excuse me, a list here of the table of contents where you can see that it was a very elaborate uh, project that they were involved in and Towards a Third Cinema was only part of that project, clearly an important one, but in order to understand better what they were driving at and what the actual larger project was, it's extremely helpful to be familiar with those other writings that surrounded, extended, and clarified aspects of the manifesto. This is just uh, somewhat easier to see it's the same table of contents that you saw a moment ago. Uh, and you see that these were all articles and mostly articles, but occasionally a, an interview from the years 1968 to 1972. In addition, and this is extremely unusual, they pub or Gatino published a collection of a few articles published in 1982 
which included a retrospective article describing the process they had gone through over a series of years through the distribution of the film, as well as elements of history in Argentina having to do with Perón. When Perón came back to Argentina, he was in power once again in Argentina. And Gatino describes all of that history, which most people weren't familiar with and wouldn't be familiar with. Again, this is the table of contents of both of those, uh, both of those issues, or both of those little books. And you see that in the last one, they come from 1979. So that's fully 10 years after the publication of Towards the Third Cinema. And as I indicated earlier, uh, these two articles here, this is actually the first one, La Cultura Nacional, the National Culture, Cinema and Hour of the Furnaces came out in Sydney Cubano. And that was a, an interview uh, actually where Gatino and Solanas responded to questions posed by Sydney Cubano, which was a major Cuban publication, cinema publication. And of course, Tricontinental, I already indicated, uh, came out of Havana also in 1969. Now, in English, the manifestos were the only writings available on new Latin American cinema. So that risked a certain kind of reification or fossilization because it inhibited debates around these questions. For example, there was a debate that took place in 1974 at an international conference uh, organized around Third Cinema, which invited filmmakers and critics from all over the world who attended that. And thanks to Mariano, we actually have a book that includes many of the discussions from that conference. Uh, Mariano managed to track down uh, a number of uh, tapes, a large number of tapes, uh, which was, and that was very early to do videotaping uh, from 1974. And he published it in the book in 2014, which you see there. Now, given this wealth of commentary, by the authors on, of Third Cinema, I thought it was misleading to let the Third Cinema Manifesto stay mired in the now standard group of manifestos, isolated and unmoored from all the accompanying and complementary texts. So you had collections in English of those major documents, those other manifestos, including towards the third cinema. This was extremely hard to come by actually, this volume by Michael Chanin, edited by Michael Chanin from 1983. It had the major manifestos. Somewhat later, Michael Martin edited a, a larger collection of articles and manifestos also, which reprinted many of those original manifestos, which you can see listed there. Now, I also felt that there was a certain promiscuousness about the term third cinema. That is, scholars and critics wrote of third cinema as a general term for Latin American militant cinema, or even referred to milit militant, sorry, referred to third cinema manifestos in the plural, when only one manifesto even used the term third cinema. So such an amalgamation did an undeserved, undeserved disservice to third cinema because it stripped third cinema of its political roots in Argentina, risking to further obscure the genealogy and centrality of third cinema to political and militant cinema. So in terms of this language hierarchy, 
French was really the dominant term in an original kind of film studies. And Spanish uh, was really relegated to the background in this language hierarchy. So all of these terms, which are probably familiar to you if you have any exposure to film studies, came from French. The writers celebrated in the early years of the discipline of film studies were largely French. We don't have any uh, names that really dominated in English in terms of this early history. Now, in addition, as part of my research, I realized that there was actually more than one version of the Third Cinema Manifesto. And the later version appeared to represent an evolution in the thinking of Solanus and Gatino. Yet this second version of the Third Cinema Manifesto, as a second version, passed unnoticed for 30 years. For no one had remarked on the discrepancies in the two Spanish versions, further dramatizing the distortion of discussions in English by freezing only one version in English amber. This discovery eventually led to my first collaboration with Mariano in 2011 in an issue of Third Text to which we both contributed. And Mariano and I proposed as part of that project translations of what we viewed as a seminal piece by Solanus and Gatino called Militant Cinema, largely untranslated at the time. Solanus and Gatino called this the most important part of third cinema, and it was an elaborate article written two years after the original third cinema manifesto. In fact, in a retrospective article from 1979, published in the current framework issue, Solanus and Gatino, I'm sorry, Gatino, who's the sole author, identified three seminal articles as the theoretical foundations of the concept of third cinema. This first article was the interview in Cine Cubano. This is from the issue of framework, in case you haven't poured over the articles yet. On the next page, Gatino identifies the Towards the Third Cinema Manifesto. And finally, identifies militant cinema as the third of those three main theoretical materials. So if you look at all of the articles that they published, or that I'm familiar with, no doubt there were others. These are from the two books that I showed earlier. Gatino identifies these three as the important theoretical statements of those years. And we chose to translate for this issue uh, the full version of militant cinema. Now, this is also taken from the article. Uh, I don't know how well you can read it, so I'll read it quickly. But the fact that other groups or filmmakers mechanically appropriated a proposal born in the peculiar process specific to Argentine liberation diverged from the original purposes of Cine Liberación. Cine Liberación was the group that Gatino and Solanus worked with, the filmmaking group, in Argentina. So that me mechanical appropriation is what I feel you see even as late as 2014 in a very large and a great uh, anthology of manifestos published uh, for many years going back all the way uh, into the 20s by a guy named Scott McKenzie. And this page, which I think is maybe hard for you to see, includes all the Latin American manifestos that we saw earlier. And it includes at the very bottom, militant cinema an internal category of third cinema, which we have published in this issue, but 
in that particular issue, in that particular volume by Mackenzie, it's a one and a half page article instead of the long article that we published in its entirety. So we had, though we tried to publish that article in its entirety in 2011, there were problems with the issue. And following the publication, uh, following the problems with the publication of that translation, some years later, 10 years later, we approached Drake Stutzman, editor of Framework, about publishing finally the full translation of two key texts and a third important text from 1979, the responses to a survey on third cinema conducted by the French journal Cinemaction. Now the point of this work was to not only fill in the context of third cinema, the lack of which made third cinema less relevant today, but also to indicate that the ideas evolved and can continue to evolve. However, one key lacuna or, or missing part has been the failure to recognize the importance for filmmakers, videography, videographers of working with political organizations. That is, unlike any of the other manifestos or militant filmmaking organizations, the theorists and practitioners of third cinema, Solanus and Gatino, saw themselves not as part of a filmmaking project per se, but as part of a political movement, which meant that the value of the filmmaking depended on the degree to which the filmmaking advanced the political goals of the political organization, what Gatino and Solanus called the instrumentalization of film. This is just, I'm sorry, showing that uh, Mackenzie was reprinting yet again, and it's a very welcome yet again, the manifestos that we were familiar with in English, uh, going all the way back to Michael Chanin's volume in 1983, though there are more here. So I'm going to simply uh, skip this and close. These are some quotations, which I won't take the time to read now, but these are quotations from the different articles that remained untranslated in English and that indicate that Solanus and Gatino actually were part of this evolving project that was actually very open. It was a flexible project, not a dogmatic project. And Many of the critics, in English at least, who attacked or at least criticized the Third Cinema Manifesto were unfamiliar with these other articles, which indicated the flexibility and what I would maintain the still current applicability of the manifesto to current struggles in film and video. And I'll close without reading this leaving this on the screen for a moment, this quote from Militant Cinema, which emphasizes the importance of working with political organizations as opposed to trying to install third cinema as a dogma, which they were definitely opposed to. So I will close with that and hand the microphone back to Parashe to introduce Mariano. And thank you again, Parashe, for the invitation today and for the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for your wonderful presentation. Now we have our uh, last speaker for today, last but not the least, certainly, Mariano Mesman. Uh, who is a researcher with CONICET, the, the National Research Council of Argentina, and also with Instituto Investigaciones Sino Germani, uh, Faculty of Social Sciences, Universidad de Buenos Aires. Mariano, uh, is, he has published on third cinema and Latin American cinema, Argentine cinema, um, many, many uh, books and articles uh, to his credit. 
Uh, some of his most recent publications include um, Estados Generales del Tercer Cine, Los Documentos de Montreal, uh, the book that Jonathan uh, introduced to you in his presentation. It's a collection of the documents that they collected from uh, the, the Montreal you know, Conference of Third Cinema that happened in 1974. Uh, so Mariano published this book in 2014. And in 2016, uh, he edited the, 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 the co-edited the, the edited uh, book on the impact of 1968 in Latin American cinema. It's a book published from Buenos Aires titled Las Rupturas del 68 en el Cine de América Latina. Mariano has co-edited this uh, special issue of framework with Jonathan and they have overseen all the translations that are there in this issue off to Mariano. Okay. Um, thanks, Parichai. Just a bit, sorry, Mariano, I have your PowerPoint with me. So yes. if you want, I can share your screen now, share my screen. Sure, uh, sure. Yes. Just a bit. Okay. Excellent. So I, I will tell you to, to change each photograph, each, each image. Um, first of all, wait, wait. Okay, here is okay. Uh, First of all, I, I would uh, th uh, say thanks to, to Parichai uh, for the, uh, the invitation for this activity, uh, for this talk, no? Also, I would say thanks to Drake because uh, she gave us the possibility to to do this special issue of, of framework that was a, a long work uh, with, ima with image, with the translation, with a lot of people that help us uh, in, this, in this work. Uh, and you see my English is, is not very good, but I will try to say something about our work for this special issue. Um, I'm going to show some image of the of the framework special issue, uh, particularly from the photo essay photo essay we made uh, for um, about two topics or two things uh, on on third cinema and cine liberation group. Uh, please next. Okay. Here you see in the contents uh, at, at the end uh, the reference to the photo essay. No, these two topics uh, were the activity of Group Cine Liberación in Argentina since uh, the hour of the furnaces in 1968 and in the following years. I mean the historical conditions for the Cine Liberación writings of which Jonathan spoke before, and the impact of the film and of the theory of third cinema or the third cinema manifesto in, uh, around the world. So next, please. So, um, First of all, you, you will find in the photo essay some, some image, some photos um, 
of Solanas, of Getino, and of group Cine Liberación around the filming of the film between 1966 and 1968, or like this one after they, they finish and when they began, they finish it and when they began to, to show the film in different parts of the world. For example, here you can see um, the, the image there uh, of uh, one, one, uh, one, one moment when the film was shown in uh, Germany, I, I think. Okay, please next. Here you, here you have uh, a photo of Octavio Gettino uh, filming the film uh, with a working class uh, worker, no, a person. The next, please. Here you have another image uh, about, uh, this is a, a photo of Cine Liberación Group and some friends in 1968. From the left to the right, you can see, for example, Octavio Getino, then Gerardo Vallejo, who was a very important uh, collaborator or a, a and founder of the group uh, from Tucumán in the north of, of Argentina. Then you have, um, with the long hair, uh, Fernando Birri. You know Fernando Birri, uh, didn't a, a member of Cine Liberación, but, but he, he did a lot of uh, activity around social and political films in Argentina before uh, Cine Liberación, since the end of the 50s. So he was a, a good friend of the group uh, after the hour of the furnaces that he saw uh, in its premiere at the Pesaro Film Festival in Italy. In the middle, you have Fernando Solanas, near Solanas, Edgardo Palero, who, who was a very important Latin American distributor of films and uh, the producer of uh, The Hour of the Furnaces. And at the end, Agustin Mayeu, who was an Argentine critic that followed in those years, the activity of Cine Liberación grew. But in the photo essay, uh, next please. In the photo essay, we, we also uh, include a image from the film, from the hour of the furnaces that had a great impact in Argentina and other places. This is a well-known image that of the end of the first part of the film uh, of, um, of Che Guevara. Um, but there, there are uh, another, uh, another image uh, of different parts. For example, in, in this case, this is a well-known image because the bibliography and critics wrote a lot, a lot about it, no? But, uh, next please. You can find also a little known image, a, at least little known outside Argentina, because, uh, for example, this one uh, of the worker struggles, uh, particularly this one of uh, industrial factories occupations during the 60s, and these are a uh, little known image because um, they are the image of the second and third part of the of the film and in general there is another problem with the history of cine liberation and third cinema that bibliography didn't speak too much about uh, the second and the third part of the film we know more the, the studies and, and the critics about the first part because, of course, was the, 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 the most interesting uh, in a cinematographic point of view, we can say. Uh, please, next. 
Okay, this is this was another image that had a, a big impact uh, from an artist and that uh, Ricardo Garpani, and that the film in, also includes. Next, please. In the photo essay, we also mention uh, the history of the group uh, uh, Cine Liberación in Argentina after the hour of the four releases until the coup d'etat of 1976. For example, we, we work also in the introduction in, in two important moments. Um, one in 1971, when the group Cine Liberación decided to become more strongly involved in the, in the Peronist movement and went to Madrid, Spain, where Perón was in exile, and uh, there they filming uh, two, two, two documentaries with Perón that they used uh, in, uh, from 1972 to 1973 in the campaign uh, for the elections of 1973 when General Juan Domingo Perón returned to the power in Argentina. Um, and please next, we also mention uh, the moment when the Cine Liberación Group published uh, in, in 1973 this book that Jonathan showed before uh, with, with, with different articles. And at this moment, uh, Octavio Getino uh, began to work in the Peronist government in a commission at the National uh, Film Institute. Um, and that was a, a, a short moment, just three, four months, but where they tried to, uh, to develop their ideas about cinema, about third cinema, about political communication from the state. No? until the, the coup of 1976. This uh, was important for us because um, they are also the, the conditions, uh, the historical conditions or, or historical activities after the hour of the furnaces that explain uh, the 1979 Octavio Getino uh, text that we translated uh, in this special issue uh, that, that uh, Jonathan spoke about it. Okay, please next. But there is uh, another part of the photo essay that link with, um, that link directly with the third text we, we, we translated, that is the, the dossier uh, about the impact of the third cinema around the world um, made it by the group Cinema Action, Guy Enevel and Monique Martineau in 1979. Uh, that was a very important dossier because there you can read um, the impact of the film and of the manifesto uh, between 1969, nine, I'm sorry, 1968, the film, 1969, the manifesto, and uh, 1979, when they did the dossier. They invite uh, 10 or 11 uh, filmmakers or critics from different parts of the world, and they ask them three questions I, I will show in a few minutes, three questions about uh, the impact of the Finland the Manifesto in, in, in their countries, no? Uh, so filmmakers or critics from Brazil, from uh, France, from uh, Canada, from United States, uh, from, from uh, African countries, they uh, and, and others, uh, from Germany wrote about this question. So it's a, it's a document where you can find the, 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 the different features of, of, this, of this influence of the Finland Manifesto and 
uh, was uh, until now just in in French. Uh, you you can read it in English in this framework special issue and and maybe I, I will try to translate it to Spanish this year. Okay, so for example, what happened with, with, this, uh, or, or, or with this question of the influence? After the premiere of the, um, of, um, of the film at the Pesaro Film Festival in Italy in June 1968, Solana Sangetino, um, also participate in, in others, uh, European and Latin American uh, film festivals in a moment of radical political actions around, also around cinema. And for example, you can see here two images. Uh, the first one is of Octavio Getino um, talking during the Latin American Film Festival of Viña del Mar, Chile, in October 1969. That is a, 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 an important moment of the configuration, can I say configuration, of the, uh, the so-called new Latin American cinema of the 60s and 70s. No? And in the second image, you have uh, Fernando Solanas, uh, also talking, in this case, in the assembly of filmmakers during the Pesaro Film Festival. And in, in the same, in, in the table, you see uh, Valentino Orsini, the Italian filmmaker, and uh, Julio Garcia Espinosa, uh, the Cuban uh, authority, film authority and, and filmmaker also, no? Um, that there were there in the assembly. I think that Pesaro 1968 was just a few days after uh, May 68 in France, and you know uh, the the questions and the protests around the the Cannes Film, film Festival. Uh, another festival in those years. But in the case of Pesaro, um, the, the, the own authorities of the festival decide to, to do uh, autocontestazione in Italiano, a self-protest, we can say, um, and continue uh, showing the films, particularly the Latin American films, the political Latin American films, while uh, they they protest um, and discuss political film in assembly, etc. Please next. After the Pesaro Film Festival, for the hour of the furnaces began a, a, a big activity of uh, for show for for distribute the film around the militant. Uh, or political film circuit uh, in Europe and in other parts. Uh, in my research, for example, I found not, not less than six or seven militant groups that use the Argentine film in Europe, uh, for example, uh, to, to do militant practice, political militant practice. So here you have one example that Solanas is there with Goffredo Fof in the middle, who was uh, an important Italian critic. Um, and they, they, you can read there that they, they are going to, to, to show the film in Northern Italy. Please, next. Um, in, in this framework, uh, the film was included in, in the catalog of, of the main uh, non-commercial or militant distributors in many countries, no? So uh, you, you have a list there, but here is an image of uh, the, the other cinema, the alternative uh, distribution company, uh, from Great Britain, 
and you can see uh, at the in the in the middle of the of the image uh, the the image of the hour of the foreigners between two others Latin American films from 1969, uh, Blood of Condor by the Bolivian Jorge San Ginés uh, and uh, El Chacal de Nahuel Toro by the Chilean well-known filmmaker also uh, Miguel Litín. Please, next. Okay, it's important to know that um, at the same time, a few political uh, films incorporate image from the Argentine film uh, the Hour of the Formances. You know the case, I think, uh, about uh, Mirinal Sen, who in Palatik, uh, the, from the trilogy of Calcutta in 1971, he introduced uh, just a few seconds from, from Solana's and, and Getino films. And you know that um, Mirinal Sen um, uh, had a, a big interest in Solana's films. In this case, we have another example from France, from France, where you see uh, where uh, Marin Karmitz in his film Comrades, Comrades included an essay uh, that shows the screening by a French Union committee of the famous fragment of the factory occupations, 10 minutes from the second part of the hour of the furnaces. And um, in this case, Karmitz put on the screen precisely the experience of a militant use of the film in France and other countries. Next, please. In this framework, the Enabel defend and promote the hour of the furnaces for the beginning of its presence in France. Guillenevel was uh, maybe the most important uh, third world uh, French critic of those years. He worked a lot with Algeria, he lived there, and um, he uh, met Solanas for the first time during the Montreal meeting uh, of 1974 that uh, Jonathan spoke before. And uh, he, he said that the film by Solana Sangetino was considered uh, there by all as the archetype of militant cinema of the time, for example. In this way, please next, Um, after, after those days in Montreal, Genevel would become Solana's friend and from then on a propagandist for the manifesto, as he also said, and as the 1979 Cinema Action dossier would demonstrate. So I will finish with this, please next. Here you have uh, the, the original version in French of the of the the image of the of the cinema action uh, uh, dossier, and please next. And here you have the the three questions that uh, the cinema action group. Uh, ask uh, the, the filmmakers and the critics that respond the questions about the film. Now, was La Hora de los Hornos distributed in your country? Did this spark controversies? What were, the, uh, what were they? It, yes, did the film contribute to establishing a network of alternative distribution? This first question was important because, and interesting, because one of the, of the main problems uh, of the film in, in some countries was that the, the classical left, we can say the communist and socialist parties uh, in, in different European countries, particularly, but also in the United States and, and some Latin Americans, uh, didn't like the, the identity of Peronis in the film, no? Uh, but for Solana Sangetino, 
Perón and Peronist was uh, the own way, the, own, the, uh, the Argentine way, we can say, to, uh, to a new society, as, as was the same in a lot of third world East countries or, or third world countries of, and at that moment, no? or before. So the second, the second question is about if the manifesto uh, towards the third cinema was published, translated uh, in, in, in the different countries, and uh, if did it provoke uh, the debates, arguments, and, and which ones, no? And the last one, uh, it is about uh, what they think uh, now and, and if they think the, it's needed to, to do changes uh, it, it, and, they, and if they think that Solana Sangetino uh, should uh, do changes uh, around their ideas. Uh, so I finish here and, and I... And I, I say again, thanks for, for this activity. Thanks so much, Mariano, for this. And now um, all, the, all the presentations are open for discussion. We can take a few questions. So here in the studio, we have uh, all the three speakers with us. We have Mariana, we have Jonathan, and uh, Rick, uh, the editor of Framework, has joined us. Uh, we started with a, with a video, uh, a pre-recorded talk and, and the PowerPoint presentation from Rick. And uh, now Rick is with us in the studio. So um, I'd like to make it open for discussion. We can take a few questions. So you may write it in the YouTube chat box, post it in the YouTube chat box, and uh, I'll work as the mediator. So I'd like to thank all the three speakers once again for this. I'm just going to come in for a second. First of all, thanks so much to both of you for that talk. Both of the talks were so interesting. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance to thank uh, the organizers because my first slide was not on and I do want to thank uh, the, um, the seminar very much for inviting us and uh, Barche for organizing also. I do want to say also that the introduction which is available on framework of this issue um, lays out very carefully with wonderful detail very clearly exactly what Mariano and Jonathan have been uh, describing and it's, it's a lot of information to take in so it's something that you can consider looking at. And thanks, of course, to you both for your great work on the issue. Uh, we have got the first question here. So Sanjay asks, Hour of the Furnaces is often mentioned as model of a political cinema. In the sense of a politicized intelligence, can narrative films embody a critical political awareness? If so, then what extent? It is for you, Shonada. <laughs> uh, well, it's a good question because there is a bias in the manifesto and in the other writings in favor of documentary, as if that has a higher priority for uh, politicized militant filmmaking. However, uh, they did not rule out uh, fiction films. Uh, generally, I think they felt that they were going to be less useful in a particular moment. But there was discussion about the Battle of Algiers, which may appear to be in certain ways a documentary, but of course it's a fiction film, a fiction film made by Italian Ponte Corvo. Uh, and arguably it's one of the most famous political films, so it's a fiction film. And the reason it attracted attention among commentators of, and as well as Solanus and Gatino, the reason it attracted attention is that 
people were unsure about whether to consider it second cinema or third cinema because they spoke, Gatino and Solana spoke so much about auteur cinema that there was a tendency to put films of auteurs in second cinema. But because of their insistence of Gatino and Solanas on the importance of the usefulness of a film in a political project, any film could be considered third cinema, whether fiction or documentary, as long it was as long as it was contributing to a political project, often being uh, guided by a political organization. So it's in certain ways that fiction film by Ponte Corvo, Battle of Algiers, is a kind of locus classicus for fiction filmmaking under the auteurist rubric, which could be considered third cinema. <clears throat> At the same time, they believed that you couldn't put a label definitively on any film because a given film might be considered part of third cinema if it were used in a particular way that contributed to those political goals of an organization. If it were not used, instrumentalized in that particular way, then it might fall into the category of second cinema. So the labels could change depending on the context, and that's why Mariano and I have been trying to emphasize the importance of the distribution history of the film as well as simply its existence. And one final comment is that in the original manifesto, they explain that the people who were doing the projecting of the film or films could choose to stop the film whenever they wanted, to comment on it, to call for comments from the audience, or they could even take Hour of the Furnaces and show only parts of it, rearrange it, comment on it, and in fact, there were descriptions in the manifesto about how there were uh, people that they called relators who would comment on the film from time to time for the benefit of the audience as well. So there was not a fixed category of what second or third cinema was, and fiction could easily fit into any of the categories, especially the second and third ones. Yes, Mariano. Yes, I would add something. Um, there is an, an interesting uh, essay, essay by um, uh, Michael Channan about the changing geography of third cinema from the 60s to the 80s or 90s, no? Um, in this framework, or, 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 or one of, of that changes, what was in, uh, during the 80s when Paul Willeman Drake spoke about him because he was a, a, a very important researcher, a professor, and, and, and an editor of framework. Um, Paul, Paul Williman organized, organized um, a, 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 third, a third cinema meeting in Edinburgh in 1986, I think. And after that, he wrote uh, about uh, third, third cinema, and he wrote, he, he wrote uh, one question so interesting. He said, that during the, the 60s and 70s, third world cinema was uh, read it, wo read it, was uh, consumed in a uh, consumed, no, consumed in a, in the first world in Europe, particularly in a second cinema way. What does that mean? That the the filmmaker from from third cinema in Europe, um, the films were uh, were consumed in in the sense of author films, 
not of militant films or third worldist films. Why? Because uh, the festivals or the or the scenes uh, or the film clubs, etc., they um, make uh, special sections about Solana's film, uh, Sembene films, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Mirinal Sound films, but. The, the idea was that people saw it as a, in a second cinema way. Now, do you remember the first cinema was Hollywood cinema for Solanz Argentino, no? in the manifesto. The second cinema was that of the, of the Nouvelle Vague so of the 60s, the author films. And uh, the, the third cinema was the, 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 the most political one. So the decolonizing cinema. So this idea, I, I, I proposed a, a, a few years ago, a discussion uh, with this idea by Paul Wilman. I mean, I, I can't discuss with him, no, but I, I propose another idea that um, uh, following the experience of Cine Liberation and the hour of the furnaces around the world, we can say that this type of reception of, of third cinema uh, in, in, in the first world as a second, in, in a second cinema way, as Wellerman said, uh, at least for the case of the hour of the furnaces, um, I don't know if I can say went together or, or was a, uh, uh, was just one part of, of the history of the hour of the furnaces because the other part and maybe most important was this uh, uh, alternative and militant distribution that we we show in in our introduction and in in our photo essay no and and and, what, and, and that also the the Cinemaxion dossier by Guy Enneville uh, also show, no? Okay. We have another question from Sanjay. What is the future of political cinema in relation to the digital media such as OTT platforms? Uh, I'm not sure why you singled me out, but <laughs> I think that's an excellent question. I think we're all wondering about that. And I have certainly don't know the answer, but I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about it particularly in relation to uh, theatrical exhibition. Uh, given the COVID pandemic, most movie theaters were closed. All movie theaters in the United States were closed uh, for a long time. And I don't think we know how they're gonna come back and will they come back? I'm inclined to think they will. Uh, but how does that affect exhibition of, let's say, films that aspire to be political? Uh, I'm not sure whether there are going to be public venues in the future for that. Uh, maybe they'll be in smaller uh, union halls uh, or political organizations rather than more public venues that we're used to seeing them in. So uh, I'm kind of optimistic that filmmakers will continue to show their films to publics, uh, but I worry about uh, the temptation to go online with distribution uh, rather than going in live distribution in public spaces or even pu private spaces, but I mean large private spaces such as union halls. So I, I think it remains to be seen. I'll, I'll relate one anecdote uh, that struck me and I think about often. Occupy Wall Street happened several blocks north of the union headquarters that I'm part of in New York City. 
uh, our union headquarters happened to be right at Wall Street. Uh, I mean, it's a very progressive left union. It's the union of all the professors and staff, professional staff at the City University of New York. There are 30,000 members. So Occupy Wall Street happened just several blocks north of our union headquarters. And they requested at one point whether they could show their media production in our union hall, which is right there on Broadway at Wall Street. And we said, of course, uh, we were very supportive of Occupy Wall Street. And they came and basically maybe 10 of them projected their films that were on the web. They showed them on the screen and then they left because they had to go other places. In other words, there was no discussion of the films, which was very different from my experience when I first saw, for example, Hour of the Furnaces, when there were a thousand people in the uh, audience who were eager to talk about the film, debate it after the screening. So I'm wondering whether younger generations uh, will have the same understanding and approach of the importance of that kind of public debate around a media production. So it's an open question. I think it's an excellent question. And I'm, wa I'm watching as carefully as everyone else. Thanks, Sanjay, for the questions. And thanks, Jonathan and Mariano, for answering them, for engaging with uh, these observations. So Voida Berman thanked all the three speakers and um, yeah, the organizers and all. And he says that Solanas would have been glad to see this transnational exchange. The thing is, uh, so as I, as I wrote in the mail that was sent to the entire institute and I, I sent emails to many other film scholars across India and we opened up a Facebook event as well. So this is our tribute to Solanas who while working as a UNESCO ambassador in Paris last year in October 2020, if I'm not mistaken, uh, contracted COVID and never returned back to cinema. So it's a tribute to Fernando Solanas. Um, and it's I'm really glad that we have been able to organize this. So I approached Mariano. Um, I, I met Mariano long back in 2015 uh, in Australia when I was doing my PhD at Monash in a conference. Then in 2018, I spent a month in Buenos Aires and worked with Mariano. So, uh, and Mariano suggested that we can organize this with Jonathan and Drake. Uh, and, and this new framework issue can be highlighted and can be discussed. So um, thanks very much, all three of you. I don't think this one, this is one last question from Pernika. So she is saying, interesting to know of the changing definitions of third cinema. You say third cinema may not be militant always, but does it have to be ideological always? Some thoughts on third cinema and ideology? I would defer to Mariana. I also will comment after Mariana. I also sure. still have something to add. So I'll comment too. So all three of you want to respond to this? Mariano, you want to say something? Yes, the, the question is what we think about uh, their ideas now, maybe. This is the question. Or can you repeat me the question? So it says, um, you say third cinema may not be militant always, but does it have to be ideological always? Some thoughts on third cinema and ideology. Yes. I, I, I think uh, the question is uh, to, to, to see that historically, uh, the third cinema and the militant cinema means different questions in different places. You know that in a lot of places we usually speak about independent cinema, 
or we say political cinema, and each group get uh, different definitions. This is important because in the present uh, and, and in the bibliography, uh, some scholars used to, to use the, the, the idea of third cinema for, uh, for experience so different around the world, you know, but there is a problem with this now, as I, as I see it, because first of all, the third world as, as, as existed uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s and from the 50s, uh, the, that third world doesn't exist more. And uh, the, the, the force, the, the, the importance of, of that idea of third world for, for, uh, for, for changes around the world is, is not the same now, of course. I mean, at that moment, a lot of also, uh, also European and North American film experience of militant cinema took the idea from third cinema or uh, third world cinema, tricontinental cinema or, 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 or different definition, but this idea of third world cinema. But now, I, I'm not sure if you, or, or I'm sure, or I think that we, we need to find uh, and be so open to, to other definitions, uh, ideological and, and political, mm -hmm. around a militant cinema. Because now the idea of third cinema, uh, and, 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 and since uh, I'm from a lot of years, uh, doesn't, doesn't say any more or too much about what is needed to do now uh, to confronting the, the mainstream or, or the power. That's what I think, no? Uh, we, we need to, 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 to think uh, historically and now that uh, the third cinema was just one idea to confront, to, to facing the power, to confronting the power, but but there were and there are a uh, lot of lot of others and in 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 in, in different situations, a film could be as Jonathan said before, uh, more or, or or less militant, uh, more uh, could 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 be shown in, in different ways. No, also no. So the ideological definition of, of a film, I think uh, it's, it's constructed uh, in, in, in particular situation, not in different parts of the world. That's what I think. I don't know if I respond. So uh, Jonathan and Drake, uh, both of them wanted to respond to this. So. Uh, let's hear what Drake has to say about it. Yes, Drake? hi. Um, yeah, I just want to add that I think that I agree with what Mariano's just said, that uh, ideology is not necessarily, I think, the best word, um, because I'm thinking in particular of a lot of social justice films that have come out, and there's a huge movement, of course, everyone knows. But in particular, um, Abba de Vernier's um, 13th, about the 13th Amendment, that was a film that when I first saw it, it came out a few years ago, I thought, wow, this is something you could exactly do what you were just describing, which is you could cut it into pieces and segments, you could take it to schools, you could generate discussion very, very easily. And um, another film is this recent film, Time, which is a documentary also about uh, prison and uh, incarceration and post-incarceration. And so that has generated a lot of um, publicity, uh, including, um, I think, a nomination for an Academy Award. So again, those, all those old um, sort of categories are very blurry. Um, but it also means that I, I understand what Jonathan was saying about theater, theater distribution and a live audience, but um, 
something like these films, just in general, they generate a lot of commentary and discussion, even if it goes kind of haywire a little bit online. So I think that we are in a new format. It doesn't mean that third cinema, I mean, I would categorize 13th as third cinema. So um, I think we have a broader definition and a wider field uh, in some ways and narrower in others. That's it. Thanks, Rick. Uh, thanks so much for this. So, Jonathan, uh, you would like to respond? Well, I would say very briefly, ideology, as I understand it, entails domination. Uh, it's a domination of ideas. Uh, and in what Mariana described as, a, a, as an earlier time of third cinema, let's say, in the third world, uh, which was one of decolonization, uh, the, the ideal, the militant cinema or third cinema really thought of itself as anti-imperial. Uh, that was, I think, one of its central goals to fight uh, for decolonization and anti-imperialism. And by the way, uh, I mentioned Tricontinental earlier and Tricontinental actually came out of uh, not only the movements of the three, three worlds, but it also came out of the non-aligned movement, uh, which India was a prominent part of at that time, starting in the 50s and into the 60s. And, you know, we rarely hear that term now. And Mariano may be right in saying, well, you know, maybe it's a little inapt to use that term now. But therefore, in terms of ideology, if ideology is uh, about the domination of certain kinds of ideas, be it that is, I don't think of it as just a neutral worldview or Weltanschauung. It's more ideas that dominate uh, discourses and that may even dominate political situations. So uh, if third cinema, generally speaking, is fighting those dominant ideas which are part of a repressive political system then of course i think they're still relevant and they have to be adapted reinvented and i i'm as i say i'm not sure how but i trust that uh occupy wall street and uh podemos and uh other movements throughout the world are working on this as as we're speaking today Thanks so much, Jonathan, for the response and also for reminding us of the time when we were part of the non-alignment movement in the third world under uh, Pandit Nehru's prime ministership. So still we work on the Nehruvian period and we, we think about what we have lost, um, especially with this neoliberal onslaught after uh, you know, our economic neoliberalization. So, uh, unfortunately, we cannot take any more questions, uh, but the discussion has been extremely lively. And I would like to thank all the scholars and students who engaged with this, uh, those who asked pertinent questions and um, you know, raised significant issues. And of course, I'd like to thank um, our three speakers, Mariano, Jonathan, Drake, uh, for helping me to organize this. Um, this event um, and all of you there's a framework issue is available online I think uh, I mean you can you can access it through our institutional access system uh, so framework as you have seen in Drake's presentation it's a great journal uh, with, a, with a fantastic legacy of publishing very important articles devoted to cinema and media studies um, so not only this issue you can you can access other issues uh, from their archives so thanks very much. And here I would like to end the session and I would like to end our broadcast as well. Thanking all our speakers and audience once again. Thanks, Parichai. Thanks, thanks Mariano. Thanks, Drake. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.